Imperium, the Philosophy of History and Politics, Chapter 6, The Structure of History. One of the unconscious assumptions of the linear scheme was the idea of the singularity of civilization. The concept civilization was used as though all highly symbolic life, wherever and whenever it appeared, was really a manifestation of the same thing, civilization. Civilization, outside of the West, was imperfect, striving to be Western, stammering and fumbling. This civilization was something that previous ages had stupidly allowed to slip away, but somehow it was always found again, hidden in a book somewhere, and passed on to the future. Again, this was rationalism. It assumed that men made their own history, and whatever happened was traceable to human excellence or to human mistakes. But, to the pinnacle of historical insight and self-consciousness, grand historical creativeness of deeds that is the 20th century, history is the record of the lives of eight high cultures, each an organism, impressed with the principle of individuality, each thus a member of a life form. The type high culture is a life form at the peak of the organic hierarchy of which plants, animals, and man are the lower members. Each of the cultures that we have seen is a member of this higher genus, an individual. Belonging as they do to one genus, they have common characteristics in their general habitué, their life necessities, their technique of self-expression, their relation to landscape and population streams, and their lifespan. The differences among the cultures are in their souls, their individualities, and thus, despite their similar structure, their creations are in the highest degree dissimilar. In the organic hierarchy, the principle of individuality is manifested at an increasing level of concentration from plants through animals to man. Cultures are even more highly individual than men, and their creations are correspondingly less capable of any inward assimilation by other cultures. With the passing of the age of materialism, the West knows once more that the development of an organism is the unfolding of a soul. The matter is the mere envelope the vehicle of the expression of the spirit. It is this ancient and universal wisdom that is the primary source of the liberation of our history outlook from the darkness and oppressiveness of mechanism. The events of a human life are the expression of the soul of that human at its successive stages of unfolding. The identical outward occurrence is a different experience for each human being. An experience is a relationship between a soul and an outer event. Thus, no two persons can have the same experience, because the identical event is quite different to each individual soul. Similarly, the reactions of each culture soul to externals of landscape, population streams, and events and movements outside the cultural area are individual to each culture. The religious experiences of each culture are unique. Each culture has its own non-transferable way of experiencing and depicting the Godhead, and this religious style continues right through the lifespan of the culture, and determines completely the philosophy, science, and also the anti-religious phenomenon of the culture. Each culture has its own kind of atheism, as unique as its religion. The philosophy and science of each culture never become independent of the religious style of the culture. Even materialism is only a profane caricature of the basic religious feeling of the culture. The choice of art forms and the content of the art forms are individual to each culture. Thus, the Western is the first to invent oil painting and the first to give primacy to music. The number feeling of the culture develops in each its own mathematics, which describes its own number world, which again is inwardly non-transferable, even though external developments may be partially taken over and then inwardly transformed by other cultures. The state idea is likewise individual, as are the nation idea and the style of the final imperium, the last political creation of the culture. Each culture has its own style and techniques, weak and crude in the classical and Mexican-Peruvian, colossal and earth-shaking in our own, its own war style, its own relation to economics, its own history style, or organic tempo. Each culture has a different basic morale, which influences its social structure, feelings, and manners, its intensity of inner imperative, and thus the ethical style of its great men. This basic morale determines the style of the public life during the last great phase of the life of the culture. 
Not only are the cultures differentiated from one another by their highly developed representation of the principle of individuality, but each age of each culture has its own stamp, which sets it off from its preceding age and from the succeeding. These differences loom larger to the humans within a culture than the difference between one culture and another. This is the optical illusion of greater size produced by nearness. To us, the difference between 1850 and 1950 seems vast. To the history of 2150, it will be much less so. We have the feeling before we study history that 1300 and 1400 were spiritually very much the same. But in fact, in that century, there were spiritual developments as far-reaching as those between 1850 and 1950. Here again, the linear scheme distorted history utterly. It said ancient and thought that thereby it was describing one thing, one general spirituality. But Egypt and Babylonia both had their own corresponding phenomena to our Crusades, Gothic religion, Holy Roman Empire, papacy, feudalism, scholasticism, reformation, absolute state, enlightenment, democracy, materialism, class war, nationalism, and annihilation wars. So did the others, the Chinese, Indian, Arabian, classical, and Mexican. The extent of information available is quite different with regard to the various cultures, but enough remains to show the structure of history. Between one age of Egyptian history and the next, there was as much difference as between 1700, the period of our Spanish succession wars, and 1800, our Napoleonic wars. This illusion about distance finds an analogy in the spatial world. A distant mountain range looks smooth, nearer it is rocky. The idea that civilization was one certain thing, rather than an organic life phase of a culture, was a part of the progress ideology. This profane religion, its own peculiar mixture of reason and faith, satisfied a certain inner demand of the 19th century. Further research will probably discover it in other cultures. It seems to be an organic necessity of rationalism to feel that things are getting better all the time. Thus, progress was a continuous moral improvement of humanity, a movement towards more and better civilization. The ideology was formulated slightly differently by each materialist, but it was not allowed to dispute that progress occurred. To do so marked one as a pessimist. The ideal towards which there was continual progress was necessarily unattainable, for if it could be attained, progress would cease, and this was unthinkable. Such a picture fitted the age of criticism, but in an historical age, this picture becomes just one more object of interest, as being the expression of one certain life stage of a certain culture. It is on par with the world picture of imminent catastrophe of mid-14th century, the witch obsessions of the 16th century, the reason worship of the 18th century. All these outlooks possess now only historical significance. What interests us is that they once were believed. But as for trying to force the old-fashioned progress ideology on the 20th century, such an attempt is ludicrous. Whoever would try stamps himself as an anachronistic mediocrity. Imperium, Chapter 6, Section 2 The word history has been employed to cover all human events, those manifesting the development of a culture and those outside of any culture. But the two classes of events have nothing in common. Man as a species is one life form. Culture man is another. The word history, therefore, designates separate things in the two cases. And what is man as a species distinct from other life forms, such as plants and animals? Simply in his possession of a human soul. This soul shapes for man a different world from the world of other forms of life. Man's world is a world of symbols. Things that for animals contain no meaning and no mystery have for man a symbolic significance. Outside of a high culture, this symbolizing necessity shows itself in the formation of primitive culture. Such cultures have an animistic religion, an ethic of taboo and totem, and social-political forms on the same level. Such cultures are not a unity, i.e., no single prime symbol is actualized in all the forms of the culture. These cultures are mere sums, collections of motives and tendencies. Nowhere is primitive man without some primitive culture of this type. Man as a pure animal does not exist, 
All animals have a purely economic reproductive existence. Their whole individual lives consist in the process of nourishing and reproducing themselves. Their lives have no spiritual superstructure above this plane. Nevertheless, man's life in primitivity, and in an area where a high culture is fulfilling itself, are two incommensurable things. The difference is so vast as to constitute one of kind, and not of mere degree. Vis-a-vis -vis the history of culture man, primitive man seems merely zoological. The history that Stanley found in progress on his African explorations was of the one kind, and Stanley himself represented the other kind. Similarly zoological is the history of the lake dwellers in Switzerland, the Chinese today, the Arabs, Bushmen, Indians, Amerindians, Laps, Mongols, and the countless other tribes, races, and peoples outside our Western civilization. The animal is solely concerned with economics. Primitive man sees hidden meaning in the world, but culture man regards his high symbols as the content of life. A high culture reshapes entirely the economic practice of the populations upon whom it sets its grip. It reduces economics to the bottom of the pyramid of life. To a high culture, economics has the same significance that the function of eating has to an individual. Above economics are all the manifestations of the high culture's life, architecture, religion, philosophy, art, science, technics, education, politics, erotic, city building, imperialism, society. The significance an individual has is the reflex of his personal connection with the symbols of the culture. This valuation itself is produced by the culture to an anti-cultural outlook, such as the curious materialistic interpretation of history, where any proletaire is worth more than Calderon, for Calderon was not a manual laborer, and therefore accomplished nothing in a world whose entire significance is economic. The difference between the history of man as a species and the history of man in the service of high culture is that the first is devoid of grand meaning, and that only the second is the vessel of high significance. In high history, men risk all and die for an idea. In primitivity, there are no superpersonal ideas of this force, but only personal strivings, crude lust for booty or formless power. Consequently, it would be an error to regard the difference as merely quantitative. The example of Genghis Khan shows this. The events he let loose were considerable in size, but in the cultural sense they have no significance whatever. There was no idea in this sweeping descent of the followers of an adventurer. His conquests were fatal to hundreds of thousands. The empire he erected lasted generations beyond him, but it was simply there. It stood for nothing, represented nothing beyond itself. Napoleon's empire, on the other hand, brief though it was, was laden with symbolic meaning that is still at work in the minds of Western men, and that is, as we shall see, pregnant with the future of the West. High cultures create the greatest wars, but their significance is not merely that they open rivers of blood, but that these men fall in a struggle of ideas. After a high culture has fulfilled itself, the populations in its former area return to the condition of primitivity, as the examples of India, China, Islam, and Egypt tell us. The world cities empty themselves, the outer barbarians plunder them bare, and the men that are left are once more clans, tribes, nomads. When outer events do not destroy the remains utterly, the caste system of the last stage remains indefinitely, as in India and China, but it is the mere skeletal remains of the former culture, which, like everything living, passes away, never to return. The memory of the culture remains, but the attitude of the remaining populations towards its products is once more entirely primitive, unchanging, purely personal. The abandoned world cities return once more to the landscapes which they once dominated. World cities that were once as proud as Berlin, London, and New York disappeared under jungle vegetation or the sands of the plain. This was the fate of Luxor, Thebes, Babylon, Padaliputra, Samara, Uxmal, Tezcuco, and Tenochtitlan. In the latter cases, even the names of the great cities have perished, and we call them after nearby villages. But it is an unimportant detail whether the city lies dead upon the surface, inhabited by a few clans who farm in the open spaces, fight in the streets, and shelter in the abandoned structures, 
or whether the sands shift over the crumbling remains.